So my name is Liz Hoffman and I'm a scientist here at Ward Science and today I'm going to talk about Ward's Data Hub and how it can be utilized in AP Chemistry categories from titrations to colorimetry to actual um, coffee cup um, calorimetry stuff. So today I'm going to do a quick run through of what the Data Hub is and what it offers to you as a user and then I'll jump into the four different activities where it is pertinent in the AP Chemistry curriculum. So when you get your AP, or pardon me, when you get your Ward's Data Hub, it comes in a nice um, Data Hub box. And that box in it will have your Data Hub, and as well as a number of different sensors. So this happens to be the external sensor that I have attached to it. It also comes, if you open up your box, you will see um, the tube for the air pressure. You will also see your charger and your USB to connect it to the computer a thermocouple, as well as four cuvettes for the colorimetry experiments that you may want to run, and the heart rate monitor. So all of that come in the box with a CD, instruction CD, as well as a user guide. So I'm going to put everything that I'm not going to be using today away so that I can go through the user guide with you. So if you want to go down to the smaller camera, the user guide is um, basically, let me, so you can see it, it has lays out exactly what sensors are built in, how to, how to go ahead and um, pair it with your laptop or your Bluetooth device of any time, as well as different activities that you might want to run. So there are four different um, data hubs units, one being the physics unit, one being general science. This one in particular is biochemistry or biology and chemistry um, and the environmental science. So one thing that's awesome about the Ward's Data Hubs is that it has 12 or more sensors all in one hub. So you don't actually have to get different units or get an air pressure monitor or a colorimeter or an external temperature, you know, your temperature probe or anything like that. It's all built into one. And across the sides, you can see all the different inputs. I'm going to unplug the external sen sensor so you can see it. So all the different inputs are around the side here and then you have the charging station in the back. And then if you want to cover everything up, you can just slide this nice little device closed and you, none of your sensors are showing. All right, so for the chemistry and biology sensor, I'm gonna go through the different sensors that are present on here. And if, um, I don't know, I think you should be able to see it on here. If not, Chris, you can zoom in a little bit. So we have over here, if you press this once, it's air pressure. This one's actually measured in kilopascals or actually in millibars. So you have barometric pressure on here as well. Then you hit the next button up, it goes to pH, dissolved oxygen, and conductivity. The next is light and external sensor, which is your thermocouple. Ambient temperature, which is the temperature in the room around you, as well as the TCK t temperature. External temperature, which is one of the probes, heart rate, humidity in GPS, and then colorimetry in red, green, and blue present absorption. So those three different wavelengths are programmed in. Particularly for AP Chemistry, the two sensors that you're going to use the most are the external temperature probe and the pH probe. The pH probe does come with the Data Hub AP, the Biology Chemistry Data Hub, and it comes in a, its own little box and calls out. It looks like this. It has a BNC connector on the end here. I will go ahead and connect that later for our experiments. I'm going to go to the next slide, Chris. So another great thing about the Data Hub is it can be used anywhere. It can be used in the classroom, it can be used in the field, it can be used wherever you want to collect data. Especially nice features, the GPS sensor. So if you want to take Example, your students out on a walk and they want to go down the stream and up a hill and see the, the pressure change or the humidity change or the temperature change or anything like that. You can track all of that by just connect, by collecting data on this sensor and then transmitting it to Bluetooth wise to your, your external data collection source. So in this sense, there is the iPad that is connected. So to connect is actually very, very simple. This data hub is actually already Bluetooth connected to this iPad. But if you look in your instruction manual, I'll walk you through, it shows you exactly 
step-by-step -step how to do everything, what buttons to push, what the buttons actually look like on the actual data hub here, they coincide directly there. So it's very simple. If you have any questions ever on how to pair it or how to use your data hub or sensors, you can feel free to contact us at sciencehelp at vwr.com and we'll be able to walk you through any troubleshooting you may have. So once you have it paired and connected, there's a number of different things that you can control and it's all controlled right on your iPad if you wish. So you can see here, this iPad is right now is not connected to the um, actual data hub itself. It actually timed out in the time that we were going, so we'll go through and I'll actually show you the steps. We're going to go to settings, Bluetooth, and this particular data hub is the 1248. That 1248 is, um, hopefully you can see it, it's on the very bottom of the um, data hub and the last four digits are what you're going to look for. So I'm going to go ahead and click connect for that 1248. The password is 1234. Hopefully this already connects it. It does automatically because I've already entered that once. So now I'll go back and I'll, obviously the software was already downloaded. You can download it free from our website. Now, once it realizes that I have it connected, now you're going to see all the different sensors on the particular data hub in question. So you can see the air pressure, barometer, pH, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, light, the analog sensor, temperature, thermocouple, pulse, external temperature, humidity, GPS, and colorimity, tree, and turbidity. So everything is right on there. Right now, the only sensor that I have working or controlled by this iPad is the external temperature sensor. If I want to turn something else on, such as light, I can go ahead and just slide that over, and it's as simple as that to turn on another sensor. Um, you can also change the rate at which you're collecting data right from your iPad. So you can do it manually, which is just start, stop. You can do it one per minute one per second, all the way down to 25,000 per second. You can also do number of samples. So say I only want 10 data points, or maybe I want 10,000 data points. You can change that all right on your Bluetooth connected device. So for the first, um, for the first experiment, we're gonna leave just temperature hooked up and we're gonna run through one of the AP activities and it's actually AP Investigation 12 and it's how does a hand warmer work? This is basically the coffee cup calorimeter experiment that AP has been using for years in their chemistry classes. Um, in order to connect your external temperature probe, you just slide your, your gray bar over until you get to the input, which is the input is right there. And literally it's as simple as plugging it in. I'm gonna go ahead and set it down and put my electrodes away. So here I have, all I have is a stir plate right now. So I have a coffee cup with a stir bar inside of it with a lid on it. So that's the whole calorimeter right there. I have 100 mils of um, 20, about 20 degrees Celsius water. So let's go ahead and measure this water. So that's just by hitting the run button and you can see on the graph, it shows about 20 degrees Celsius right there, and it's actually reading exactly 20 degrees Celsius on the data hub, as you can see as well. You can go on to the next slide, Chris. I'm gonna take this, and I'm actually gonna pour it right into my coffee cup. And turn the stir bar on. The stir bar is just there, so obviously, so that we can get a nice, even, um, mixture of our hot and our cold water for this first part. All right, so that's spinning nicely. Over here, I have another beaker, and this beaker actually has warm water in it. So if we look, it should show on here while it goes up, the warm water. So we had 20 degrees Celsius water already in the cup. We'll figure out what the temperature of this water is. It should be a little bit over 50. It's very important to know the mass of this, this water beforehand. Obviously, this, each of these um, weigh 100 grams and the, know the temperature, starting temperature of the cold and the warm water. So this looks like it's right around 52. So 
so we have a starting temperature for the water. We're going to go ahead and insert the um, external temperature probe through the top of the coffee cup. This is just completing your calorimeter and putting it on, making sure that everything fits nicely. Because as soon as you enter you, the hot water into the cold water, you want to make sure that no heat escapes. So again, the data hub can be used however you want. In this case, I want to have it run for 10,000 samples for external temperature. And that's just so that we get a nice, nice reading of everything. So it should be reading right now what the cold water is. It's right around 24. And then we're going to go ahead and enter the hot water in with the cold water and close up as quickly as possible and see the change. So students can then take this graph data and they can export it directly to Excel. They can save it. They can manipulate it however they wish. But it's all right. All the data points are right on here. There's actually, if I hit um, stop, which I'll make, wait till it levels out a little bit, I can hit stop and I can hit save. The data can be saved, whatever name you choose to save it as. Or I can export it. Save as a photo, save to the clipboard, say open in a spreadsheet. So you have all of these options right from the iPad itself, from the data you collected. The next part of this um, AP number 12, I'm just going to go ahead and dump my water into my waste speaker because I need my, need my cup again. And this time it's the same concept. Only instead of adding warm water to the cold water and watching it change, you're actually going to add a number of different salts. And I'm only going to show one salt, which is magnesium sulfate. But the kit actually comes with a number of different salts for the students to experiment with. And watch how the temperature changes with the addition of different salts. So which, re which type of reaction is taking place and how fast does that reaction take place within the coffee cup calorimeter? Before I move on, are there any questions um, on AP 12 at all? No? Okay. All right, so that's basically how the external temperature probe works. Um, you don't need anything other than basically using this as your thermometer. So just Think of this probe as your thermometer and also as an awesome data collection method for your students to use integrating technology into the classroom. Whether it is AP Chemistry or any of the other activities that you do, this one in particular happened to be AP Chemistry number 12. All right, so the next one, what we're going to look at is actually the, um, the pH probe. And so in order to connect that, you're going to slide it over until you see the BNC connector. And it's all of the external probes, the dissolved oxygen, the conductivity, and the pH probe all connect through this same external port, so this same BNC connector. And they just plug in right here and snaps on. So that's, that's really all it is in order to connect the pH probe. And now you have a pH meter instead of a thermometer. Put that thermometer away. So when, now that we want to switch over to um, the pH meter, we want to go ahead and make sure that our sensors are changed on our iPad. So we're going to change it. We can leave external temperature on if we wish, but we're not going to be using it. So let's turn on the pH meter. And you can you'd see on your um, data hub that when you hit run, and obviously I don't have anything, it automatically switched to pH. So it's reading pH now. And I didn't actually touch the data hub at all in all, in all of that. So I'm going to put this away and bring over my burette. So for K AP Chem investigation number 14, it's all about titrations. And titrations are a fundamental concept in AP Chem, and this is a great activity to introduce probeware into the AP classroom. And the Data Hub is just a perfect example of one way that you can do that. So what I have over here is the first part of this activity. So I have different vials, and in these vials I have 0.1 molar NaOH, 
0.1 molar HCl and 0.1 molar acetic acid. So what the students are going to do is they're first going to make, take the pH of each one of these individual test tubes. Make sure that when you use the test tubes that you use test tubes big enough in order to fit your pH probe in. Take it out of its holding solution. Oh, and I should mention that the pH meter comes calibrated under normal conditions at 7. If there is, for any reason, you have, you're working with the pH meter and it doesn't seem to be calibrated correctly, throughout the manual there is a way in how to calibrate it at pH 7 to get it back um, to where it should be for you. And if you have any questions or concerns or problems doing that, again, just reach out to us at Science Help and we can help you calibrate your probes for you. So make sure that we, we go in and I won't do each one of these, but I want to just show you how simple it is and I'll go right underneath the camera here. Literally, I'm just inserting the probe in, just like a regular pH probe. It's nothing simple or nothing difficult or anything like that. I'm going to hit run so that it collects data and you can see it's about 13.3 for um, 0.1 molar NaOH, which is perfectly correct. The first part of AP Chemistry 14 is to add a cup, one drop of phenolphthalein to both the 0.1 molar HCl and the 0.1 molar acetic acid. Once you add that, you carefully add 0.1 molar NaOH to each one of those. So each, I have two, te one test tube of 0.1 molar NaOH for each. So slowly you're going to add about half, the students are going to add about half of the NaOH to the HCl and wait for a color change. So that color change, is, since it's phenolphthalein, should happen right around seven at the end point or the midway point. Then they're gonna add, they're gonna take the measurement with their pH and see what the actual pH is. Then they're gonna add the rest of the NaOH and tell and record what the new pH is. And they're gonna do that for both the acetic acid and for the HCl. It's a very rough um, measurement and it's basically in showing the students how to find an endpoint with an indicator but realizing that they very well could go over the go over the endpoint and so i'm going to give you an example of what the students may do just for one of these to show so this is five mils and this is 10 mils so i'm going to add about five mils of my naoh to my hcl so there's the color change oh it goes away because it's not quite to the end point yet but if i add exactly five mils right there because I added five mils incrementally wise on the test tube, it's not exact. It's not as precise as a burette would be, and that's kind of where the, the experiment's going. So you can see that this is very bright pink. If I measure it, I can almost guarantee that that pH is gonna be basic instead of neutral. And you can see, in fact, it is. It's at 12.45. So, a way to get around adding too much base or acid during a titration is to use a actual burette and to titrate dropwise. So that's what the students are going to do in the next part of the experiment. So in my burette, I have an unknown concentration of NaOH. And in my um, flask on the bottom, I have 0.05 molar HCl. So students are going to measure, first measure the pH of the HCl. So stick, go ahead and stick the, the pH probe right in there. And you can see it's still reading. I'm going to stop it and start collecting data fresh. So it's at about 1.56, 1 1.57, which is it's a really good pH for 0.05 HCl. Now ideally, you don't, you don't have an indicator in here, so ideally you would, you would want to swirl this as you're adding your, your unknown base dropwise into it. So I'm going to add my unknown base in, in about two mils at a time. And you can go on to the next, next slide so that it's clear. And one more. There you go. So I'm going to add, I have my base, or I have my base all the way up to the top here. I'm going to add it in two mils. And then go ahead and level out what the pH is. All right, my, so my pH has moved to 1.6. And then I'm going to add in another two mils. And it's gone to about 1.7. And another two mils. And you can see each addition 
is jumping up. So if you graphed this, if the students graphed this, they would graph point-wise. They wouldn't graph it with the actual pH probe in here. But it's a great way for st students to see the steps up at each individual pH. And there's another two mils. So we're really close now. So we, we jumped up all the way up to two, but we're obviously still acidic in our, in our beaker. Another two mils brings us to 10 mils of unknown base added. So you can see, wow, there was a big jump up there. So there's our titration curve. That's the midpoint that we just went over right there. And you can see that clearly on the graph. If we add another two mils, we're going to increase more basic. So students can measure it while they're going, or they can measure just point by point. And to make it clear to the students, I always told them to measure point by point. So don't actually graph it as they're adding the acid, because if you do, you see these jumps that I get. It's not exactly a clear, smooth titration curve. So if you just measure point by point instead of collecting data throughout the whole time, you'll get a more smooth titration curve, like the one that you see on your screen here. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So that was, that's a simple titration using the pH probe for AP Chem. Are there any questions before I go on to the next one from the people on the phone? No? All right. So the next particular AP Chem activity that can use ProBear is AP number 15, which is buffering. So will that product ask, act as a buffer? So this is another titration. So titration is very big, as I said, in AP chemistry. So this is just another way to use a titration, use the pH meter, and bring probeware into the AP classroom. You can go to the next one if you want. So I have 0.1 molar NaOH already in my um, burette, which I didn't tell you before because it was an unknown, and the students would have calculated what it was by using the endpoint or the midpoint of the titration curve. However, it is 0.1 molar NaOH. I'm going to actually go ahead and add a little bit more 0.1 molar NaOH so I have it back to zero for the next experiment. Always great to use a funnel to help you pour above your head so you're nice and safe. All right. So then I have three beakers here. Each one of these beakers is labeled as 0.01 molar citric acid, 0.1 molar phosphoric acid, and 0.1 molar glacial acetic acid, or it's not glacial acetic acid, gla acetic acid. So the students, uh, you can see in the procedure here, the students are going to have 150 milliliters of citric acid, 150 milliliters of phosphoric, and 150 milliliters of acetic, and that's so that they can do three individual titrations if they want. So they're gonna transfer 25 mils into the beakers, which I have here. You can go to the next slide if you want. And then they're going to basically do a titration. So they're going to measure the pH of the start. All right. So 2.73. Again, it's the same procedure that you would do when, you're, when we did the titration before. You're going to add a little bit of your base to each of your acid and see how the buffering properties of that acid change. So over time, you will see... So I'm adding, I'm going to add it slowly, as slowly as about a mil every four or five seconds. And just stir it slow, slightly with the, with the um, pH meter. If you, would, if you wanted to, you could take data points or you could have, have them construct a graph like I'm constructing here. So you can also do rough titrations this way or actual titrations where you do point by point. So a rough titration is always nice for a student to kind of get an idea of where the end point's going to be, and then they go ahead and do the actual point by point titration. So you can see right here, this acid actually didn't switch over until I added approximately 8 milliliters of liquid. So 8 milliliters of base. And this was the citric acid. You're going to go, you could go ahead and do the same for both the phosphoric acid and the acetic acid, and you'd get graphs that looked just like the ones in front of you or the one that I have on the graph on the data hub here. Do you want to go to the next slide, Chris? The next part of this 
um, AP Chem activity is actually doing the inquiry part. And that's another thing that's great about the Data Hub is it's intuitive for students to have taking the iPad aside just to have on their desktop and have them be able to just use it as a meter. So they can do the inquiry part of the experiments for all AP Chem activities with it, with it right in front of them. And they can, they can I, could, I say mess up, they can make mistakes and they can change their procedure and they can say that this hypothesis wasn't correct, but let me go ahead and change it this way without having a big cumbersome piece of equipment there or walking over to the other side of the room to take a pH measurement and coming right back to their desk. So that's one thing that's really convenient about this 12-in-1 sensor is I like to say you can have one per lab group and you don't need any more equipment for them. So this kit happens to come with um, Diet Coke, Diet Sprite, lemonade, and grape juice. And basically the students are going to determine which acid is present in each of those juices that is causing this buffering activity. So we measured phosphoric, acetic, and citric acid in the first part of the activity. Now tell me what's present in the unknown based on their titration curves. Any questions on the phone about this activity? No? All right, then I'll go on to the last activity, which is also another buffering activity, and again, another titration. So I'll put away the three that I used. So I'm going to walk through this part, the half of this activity with you, and the other half of the activity actually is the exact same, only instead of a base that they are titrating with, they actually would titrate with an acid. So you can go to the next slide if you would like. So in this activity, they're going to take um, acetic acid and they're going to take sodium acetate, 15 mils of each, and they're going to mix them together in, in a small beaker. They're, they're then going to divide that beaker in half and add 15 mils of water to each. So the pH of this act, these two solutions, beakers one and two, should be the same. And if we look at it on our graph and on our data hub, you can see that it's 4.6 and 4.6. So they're exactly the same. So this beaker one would be used to titrate with a base and beaker two would be used to titrate with an acid to see the buffering abilities of the sodium acetate and acetic acid mixture. You can go ahead and do the next slide. So this is one particular burette. Again, it has 0.1 molar NaOH in it. I don't have a burette set up for 0.1 molar HCl, but it would be the same procedure again. You would add five mil increments of hydrochloric acid. So I'm gonna go ahead and add five mils of this. This is currently at 11. So I'm gonna go to 16. And I'm gonna take my pH probe again and I'm going to see that it only jumped up to 5. You can go ahead and go on to the next one, slide 2 so you can see the data table. And now I'm going to add another 5 mils of the base. So I'm going to go from 16 to 21 on my burette. And again, to stir. And even with the addition of 0.1 molar NaOH to this mixture, we only moved up slightly in pH. We haven't changed. So this, this is actually the buffering ability of this mixture here. So even with the addition of a base, it's still an acidic solution. So that's what the students are going to understand with this activity is how a buffer works and how different chemicals and different preservatives and different things that we in our, in our food and in our bodies and in our environment act as buffering, buffering agents for the world around us. Okay, I think that those are the three, the, f the, three, the four main activities that we're going to talk about. The, on the screen you can see that a a AP number 16 part 2 is just the inquiry part of it again. So basically this is actually the most, this is the last AP chem activity and this is the most in-depth chem activity for the students to do an inquiry and it's determining a buffer that you will use, that a pharmaceutical company will use. And it's, it's a really fun activity, and it's usually at the end of the year for students, and I really love it, and it's, it uses a lot of different brain power, and I think it's a lot of fun. So that's what's on the screen there. I think the next slide is just um, the different products. So we do offer APs 1 through 16, which align to the College Board standards, um, but 
the main product focus today is this data hub and I really want to stress the importance of the data hub and all the sensors that it has to offer you and all the ways that you can integrate probe really easily into your classroom so that you don't have to have lots of cumbersome different probes laying around or have students share you know that one pH meter that you have or that one conductivity meter that you have everything is right in your hands right in your students hands nice and easy and accessible for everybody do we have any questions on the phone Refills for these kits? There are not any refills for these actual chem kits. The chem kits, all that are in, is involved in a chem kit from us are the chemicals. So if you would get, if you would buy another one of the AP number four, in fact, you would just get everything that you would need for that activity to run again. So the, all the chemicals that you would need to run a whole nother classroom. Whereas some of our other kits, you get consumables and like cups or beakers or anything else that we don't, all we give you is the chemicals that you would need to perform the, the experiment. Thanks guys.